afternoon. My name is Mark Jordan. I'm the UN representative for the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Uh, on behalf of GFDD and its executive director, Natasha Despotovic, we thank you for joining us today to celebrate the presentation of our publication entitled Climate Change in the Dominican Republic, Coastal Resources and Communities. Uh, the publication is authored by GFDD fellows and University of Rhode Island master's students in marine affairs, Matt Rosa and Hilary Lovett. GFDD is a non-profit organization which together with its sister organization in the Dominican Republic, Fundación Global Democracia y Desarrollo, is dedicated to the advancement of global collaboration and exchange relevant to Dominican professionals, general audiences, and its institutions in the homeland and abroad. With offices in New York, Washington DC, and Santo Domingo, the two foundations conduct research, enhance public understanding, and offer capacity building in areas crucial to the social, economic, and sustainable development of the Dominican Republic and the region. Through its fellows program, GFDD seeks to complement the overall mission of the foundations to promote academic exchange, generate scholarship, and influence the creation of public policy related to economic and social development, both at the national and the international levels. Through the work of fellows such as Matt and Hillary, GFDD seeks to generate scholarship on issues at the forefront of the UN agenda in order to give voice to national and regional concerns and offer viable solutions to domestic and international challenges. The participants gathered here today include Donald Robidoux, the Associate Coastal Resources Manager at the Coastal Resources Center, Mr. Matt Rosa, our former GFDD Research Fellow and author of this publication, and Ms. Hilary Lohman, GFDD Research Fellow and also co-author of the publication. Thank you all for being here. Now, we're going to have a slightly informal discussion today. Uh, we're going to start with some presentations, so the two authors are going to give their presentations, and then uh, Don's also going to give a presentation on them the work of the center and also provide some comments on the, the publication itself. After that, we're going to break into a, a Q&A for about 20 minutes, half an hour, and it gives you an opportunity to ask your questions. Uh, feel free to ask <coughs> any questions that you like that are related to the topic, uh, either about the publication or the work of the center, whatever you want to talk about, uh, this is the time to do so. Um, and after that, we have uh, some beverages and uh, some food that you can uh, feel free to, to go nibble on and have a, have a discussion with the other speakers as well informally. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick background of the speakers themselves before launching into the presentations. So I'll start with Don. Don joined CRC in 1977. He's an expert in policy analysis and the design and management of local and state level coastal resources management programs here in the US, but also in developing countries. Don currently works in Tanzania as a coastal planner. He co-authored the New Coastal Climate Change Adaptation and Guidebook. He's also served as an information specialist for the USAID-funded Global Balanced Project, which advocates an integrated approach to issues concerning population, health, and environment. Here in Rhode Island, Don has helped to develop the State's Marine Resource Development Plan, and he's currently conducting a GIS-based inventory of its economic water. Hillary is our GDD first candidate and author of the publication. She has an MA in Marine Affairs from the university and a BA in Animal Behavior in Spanish from Buckley University. <coughs> With a passion for conservation issues in the face of climate change, Hillary will present to us a summary of her research which considers the ability of individuals and communities to adapt to shifting climate conditions. Finally, with us today is Matt Rosa. Matt is a social scientist and entrepreneur from Rhode Island, with over a decade of experience in international development and natural resources governments throughout the US, Latin America, Caribbean, and Southeast Asia. Matt participated in the Fellows Program uh, from January to April of 2014, to examine the status of governance factors driving climate change adaptation planning in Santo Domingo. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Politics, an MA in Political Science, and he completed his Master's in Marine Affairs here at the Royal So without further ado, I'll start with you, Hilary, if that's okay.
afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm going to just jump right in. So I'm Hillary. Um, I'm presenting the. This was my thesis research as a research fellow for Fuglode on vulnerability and adaptive capacity to climate change in coastal communities of the Dominican Republic. <clears throat> so climate change is happening. Uh, it manifests itself in many ways, from extreme temperatures, both highs and lows, loss of typical seasonality, uh, changes in precipitation that causes both droughts and floods, and increased intensity and damage from storms. These impacts already have and continue to contribute to social and political instability around the world. Climate change is a threat to human security, but it is not a problem that is out of our control. <clears throat> So projected climate uh, conditions and impacts are deemed alarming for the next decade, at least. Uh, it's crucial to connect dots between social, ecological, and economic camps in order to imagine, if not accurately predict, the outcomes of extreme climate risks. We need to think about what events might happen, at what scale and intensity, and how society will respond. How society will respond can be measured and assessed via adaptive capacity, which has been deemed um, the most, the characteristic most important um, and most effectively addressed by policy. So I conducted a sum, uh, study two summers ago now, in the summer of 2014, um, in coastal communities of the Dominican Republic to examine the potential impacts of climate change to people's livelihoods and well-being by looking at vulnerability and adaptive capacity. <clears throat> So lots of different terms, especially in the academic community. Just going to clarify um, for the purposes of this study, vulnerability um, is defined as the susceptibility to disturbances. Adaptive capacity is the ability to respond and or cope. And resilience is sort of the other end of the spectrum from vulnerability. It's the ability to maintain or return to a stable state after a disturbance. So for right-brainers, um, I like to, this is a very simple breakdown of the relationship between these terms. Um, vulnerability and resilience, again, are sort of two swinging ends of a spectrum, and adaptive capacity is the hitch in between. Um, so, adaptive capacity is really of utmost importance in determining if an individual or a community or a system of any type is more vulnerable or resilient. It's a very strong teller. Um, so these are the three sites in red that I worked in. This is the Dominican Republic. I worked um, up north in Monte Cristi, in Samana, and in, um, down by the capital city in La Caleta and Boca Chica. So I conducted 175 surveys <coughs> total in these three sites. Um, and the survey participants were split between direct and non-direct resource users. Um, so much of the research related to climate change vulnerability tends to focus on certain demographically categorized groups of people, such as, uh, for example, by livelihood, so studying fishermen or studying farmers or grazers, um, for example. Um, but I think communities are often more integrated than that. They're integrated systems composed of individuals with diverse livelihoods um, that directly and not directly, indirectly, uh, rely on natural resources for security and well-being. So reliance includes for nutrition, for income, for safety. Uh, for example, reefs and mangroves reduce storm surge impacts to a coastline. Um, and also just simply for a functional integrated community. So when one type of livelihood or occupation becomes threatened, is there a ripple effect through an interdependent social system? In some sense, is an entire community at risk? as soon as part of it is at risk. So my goal with this research was to first examine the general characteristics of vulnerability and adaptive capacity, and then to compare these characteristics among uh, various other categorizations of coastal Dominicans, including types of livelihoods and also general conditions of household well-being. So um, this is fun for me because I can just, this is the less academically buttoned up presentation of my results. So what are the factors that characterize vulnerability and adaptive capacity? They fell into two self-prescribed uh, 
categories themselves, which is flexibility, which um, I would argue is a reflection of how willing one is to make a change, and security, which is a more reflection of how able one is to make a change. So being willing and being able are not the same thing, but they're related. Um, so the indicators of flexibility include attachment, uh, excuse me, the ability to plan and reorganize, uh, attachment to one's occupation, and attachment to place or community, a place-based attachment. And um, the indicators of security are employment security, um, which is a reflection of job security and preparedness to adapt in the occupation that you currently hold. Employability, which is one's preparedness to transfer skills and services to a new occupation if necessary. And financial security, which is the confidence in one's savings um, and the awareness of possible economic impacts stemming from potential claim, uh, changes in both climate and um, success of your livelihood. So, um, do these factors vary between direct resource users and non-direct resource users, so fishermen and other people in the community or tour operators and other people? Yes. Um, statistically significantly different in their attachment to occupation. Um, so direct resource users, people who work directly with these resources, showed a higher attachment to occupation. So again, this is a direct reflection on their flexibility or their willingness to make changes. Um, so, and it reflects a lower adaptive capacity when climate change and or other reasons for limited resource availability um, reduces productivity or income from one's livelihood. And this is not new or different in the Dominican Republic. This finding agrees with numerous studies of job satisfaction all over the world. Um, fishermen are more attached to their occupation and less willing to leave that occupation for something else. Um, and so then the final the third research question, do these factors vary? amongst individuals who do and do not share the household responsibility for income. So if you're the only person with a job in your home or not. Yes, um, the indicator of financial security was significantly lower for individuals who were the sole income providers of their within their household. So this is a reflection of one's security or their um, ability to adapt rather than a reflection of their willingness to adapt. Um, so, individuals who are sole providers might feel less able to make changes and adapt, um, such as a change in occupation, because of a lack of alternative or supplementary sources of income in the home, whereas shared providers may feel more able to adapt because they do not feel as individually responsible for household financial security and well-being. Um, this as well um, agrees with studies of occupational diversification in, in the coastal communities around the world. Um, individuals who were sole income providers were less willing to consider leaving their current occupation than those who had other people in their home sharing the responsibility for bringing in income. So this suggests that the factors that influence whether an individual will feel able to make changes and adapt may be better understood if viewed through a wider lens that considers an individual's relationships and role to others in their household, family, or other type of broader social network. Um, so I return to this slide just to reiterate the relationship between uh, vulnerability and resilience and the role that adaptive capacity plays. So if we identify forms of uh, vulnerability and we want to build resilience, how do we use adaptive capacity to get there? So generally speaking, um, I think it's important to notice that while the statistical differences from the study that I just mentioned are important, um, so too are the statistical similarities. So most of the factors characterizing vulnerability and adaptive capacity showed no significant difference among different coastal resident categorizations by livelihood and household structure. So it's important to consider policies and programs that include many different parts of the community as they are all interrelated and interdependent when viewed through a wider lens. Um, so more specifically, um, with reference to the higher attachment to the occupation, to one's occupation of direct resource users, and therefore the lower um, flexibility and more vulnerability, um, alternative options like alternative livelihoods or um, investments in education and training programs may be better received by individuals who have not yet entered into or are not yet fully integrated into a resource-dependent occupation like fishing. 
Um, those who are nested in these occupations are difficult to extract. It's been shown time and time again. So efforts that address coastal populations that before or outside of these groups may see greater chances of success. So for example, when I think of what do you mean, I think of youth programs in fishing communities, so addressing um, the youth of fishermen before they really get attached to the jobs on the water. And finally, um, with reference to the lowered financial security of sole income providers for the household, um, I believe that providing a small financial safety net um, to jumpstart alternative occupational initiatives um, and buffer from the risk of financial collapse or debt that it would take that is at risk if you leave your occupation. Uh, this may make a big difference to households who are interested in but feel unable uh, to make changes by make changes and adapt by adjusting their livelihoods. So that's all. Thank you to Tracy, who's not here unfortunately, my advisor. Uh, Ruben was my in-country advisor uh, with Mongolia and the Dominican Republic. Thank you to the foundation for supporting my research. Thank you for Hillary for explaining all the big words too, because I'll do a less academic, rigorous presentation here. Um, so I was looking at the coastal resources being affected by climate change in DR. And so the, the problem that I was looking at, the question, while I was asking these questions, I was sort of asking myself, well, where are we in the planning stage? What's going on with the planning? But then with speaking with a lot of faculty and researchers, no, we're not even at planning yet. We're, what do we need to do before we start planning? Um, so I was looking at these questions that were going to be critical to eventually planning, is what are the resources we need to be looking at that are most at risk here, and what are some of the barriers and opportunities we're going to be dealing with in the planning process? So when I went into this, my initial idea, when I was hypothesizing, I thought was, I was going to be telling a story about maritime infrastructure and the sea level rise. Um, and I was thinking I was going to find a lot of the private sector that have so much economic interest vested in adaptation um, and very little government action. Um, as usually the case, I was completely wrong. So I'll tell you more about that. Um, why I felt this was an interesting place to do this research. Um, a World Bank study came out a few years ago listing Santo Domingo as one of the most vulnerable cities in the world for GDP. There's so much at risk, so much to lose here. Uh, and we all know the people in this room who study this sort of thing, so we know just how critical coastal resources are to these small island developing states. So it was a really interesting laboratory to ask some of these questions. And what I wanted to do was apply an ICM lens, or integrated coastal management, so much of this thought leadership happening right here on campus and down the road at CRC. Um, and to, I wanted to do something that would have, hopefully, at least an intend to have some practical applications, really come up with some explicit recommendations that could maybe provide some guidance. Um, so one of the main terms I'm dealing with is governance. Um, and when we're looking at this, again, this is, a, this is a, something that derived from a lot of the thought leaders right here on URI that I had the privilege to get to work with and learn from. Um, so we're looking at sort of how both the goals that we're setting and the rules that we're playing by and the procedures that we're undertaking to go through these processes. And we're looking at the major um, sources of governance, being, you know, we think of obviously the government, but then we also have the civil society, academia, NGOs, um, and then we have the private market, all of these um, you know, economically driven businesses. Um, and so why we want to look at all these, these are, these are all the major factors at play when we're trying to understand the human impact when we're trying to come along with these ecosystem-based adaptation plans. And the other guiding philosophy that I was trying to bring into this work was again derived here by uh, Stephen Olson and Don Robidoux and all these great minds right down the road. Uh, so we're looking at these kind of a four level step to actually having su successful, sustainable uh, coastal man coastal governance. Um, and we weren't even at the point where we're looking down the line. We're at looking at the bare bones here. What's the number one step when we're looking at how to have these outcomes that we're looking for? So we're looking at the constituencies involved, the actual people, the capacities that are needed to get these plans underway. Um, if there's the actual commitment, like money and authority to make plans viable, 
and are, we actually have goals that we can measure and can we say to ourselves, this is working or this isn't working, what can we put it up against? So when I'm trying to cover these bases, and keeping in mind these sources of governance, I was doing semi-structured interviews when I tried to hit these major sections by getting some folks at the top level, federal guys, all the way down to local community leaders, and getting all the private market, like the, um, the hotels and resorts, these people that are really have invested and are expecting returns. Um, and then the civil society, we want to get the like, professors and nonprofit leaders, a lot of folks that Hillary also got to work with. And so when I was dividing, devising or coming up with this interview instrument, um, which you can have a great time reading through all of these questions uh, later on in these books. Um, but I'll sort of pull a couple of snippets of what I was, I was trying to get the types of questions that were directed at eliciting the types of qualitative feedback that would say, I could then say, okay, we do have the user groups uh, that are going to be affected by this are on board. Okay, so we're at a point now where constituencies are being involved. Are we at a point now where we have pilot projects that we're learning lessons from? Um, are we actually having legislation that's giving authority to for the right bodies to be taking action? Yeah. So, um, and are we getting things that are a time-based goal or something that's measurable so we can actually go out and say yes or no, how do we achieve this goal? So what I came back with for really was what I was thinking this was going to be about shipping and ports and flooding. It was really it was the coral reefs is what came through at, in the Santo Domingo area for several reasons. One was going to be for in terms of climate change adaptation planning, the protection from um, all these storms, and then the different ocean acidification that's going to be causing uh, migration patterns to change, it's affecting the fisheries. And also one of the major drivers here when I was thinking about what are the sectors that are most vulnerable economically, and we're looking at tourism. And that's why we need these reefs. I actually saw these guys down there. Um, so that's why these reefs are so important, again, because this is where a lot of the money that's coming from. So when these are going away, you're losing your beaches, you're losing your snorkeling and scuba diving. Um, and a lot of the barriers and that we're really seeing, there was, there, was, there was a ton of effort coming from the federal government. So much so that things were getting almost running into each other. And policies were overlapping and authorities were being shared by folks and either too much was getting done or not enough done. Um, and really where the most progress was being and the most optimism that I saw and with everyone I spoke with were these nonprofit organizations like the one Hillary worked with, this group in La Caleta, where they were saying, okay, this is now a protected area, fishermen, you're no longer allowed to extract from here. But now on the flip side, you're now, we're going to do coral regardening and you're now the tour guides too. So it's a great sustainable livelihood and it's bringing back the ecosystem and it's driving tourism. So it's hitting all these different points that they needed. Um, and that's why it's... Just a, great, just a great example of when authority is delegated and there's a good commitment, the government is saying, we're now committing you with some finances and the authority to manage your now, this nonprofit is now in charge of this area. So that's my, my major recommendation to walk away with, I'd love to see more of, is these co-management relationship arrangements where uh, the civil society is having this autonomy or, or at least some sort of an ownership, at least in a management point of view, um, and to see a lot more of these trainings going on. Um, like I got the chance last year to get involved in a different area, bringing training fishermen to fisher folk, fisher people, fishers, to be the tour guides now, be the ones who are bringing foreigners to understand and get to really know your livelihood and your community and your traditions. And again, it's hitting all these marks where we're not over, we're not over fishing, we're not over stressing, we're not doing destructive practices. We're bringing in foreigners that are bringing in money. We're preserving the ecology and preserving these traditions as well. So I have a lot of people thank for, thank to be thanked for. I didn't, I forgot what Mark, sorry. Um, Dr. Becker was a huge help in getting all this together. Um, Steve Nelson, folks, another contemporary of Don who laid the groundwork for a lot of this uh, ideas. Um, and a lot of the folks down in DR that were really helpful and super accommodating and just even to this day, stay friends that I can stay in touch with. We're always bouncing ideas around. I didn't know if we're gonna leave questions to the back. Um, yeah, so especially new students, I know in the past some have, I mean, I'm so happy to hear when folks reach out to say, you know, ask questions about going places. And if you wanna learn more about these types of fishermen turned into tour guides, check out the Coastal Ecotourism website. It has a list of a lot of these places where you should either 
consider doing research or visiting for yourselves. Okay, thank you, Matt. Now I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Don Rodriguez. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be skipping through the first third of this presentation, sorry, but I'm going to get to the, some arts and crafts of climate change adaptation. I'm not sure that this will live up to the billing that, that Matt in particular gave, but I'm going to try to talk a little bit about uh, what we do at CRC very briefly. Oh, uh, dear. Well, you can use the arrows. I'm happy, I'm happy with the arrows. Okay. Okay, so basically, there's many, many people that are sort of that are working on climate change adaptation. But just uh, one, uh, one, one group that's sort of involved in, in the arts and crafts and all this. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about So we're about 20 uh, full-time professionals. but many, many, many more people than that working in a variety of different countries, particularly in Eastern and West Africa. Um, since the resume uh, on the website's a little out of date, so that currently the co-PI of the Ghana Sustainable Fisheries Management Project along with Brian Crawford, who's the chief of party now in Ghana. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what uh, Hillary and Matt are talking about from, the, from this, uh, a recent uh, sort of lived example of uh, practical experience. We're basically sort of a fancy extension outfit, an international extension outfit, but we have a lot of activities in Rhode Island and continue working in Rhode Island for over 40 years. And there's a lot of interchange back and forth between experiences in Rhode Island and the United States and in the different, different developing country that's the settings that we work in. And we're pretty much a mishmash of different kinds of professionals. Um, several of us have PhDs, but many of us have master's degrees very applied oriented. Um, like it's really kind of hard to describe what CRC is like until you sort of dive into it. And uh, uh, it's again it's a very mixed and sort of blended thing, which I think lends itself to, to carrying out some of the ideas that I have I'm going to skip the some of the slides here. And basically, as I mentioned, we work in a variety of different countries over time. Um, and so uh, I think we, we sort of see ourselves as taking U.S. town, New England town country governance, which is very traditional, uh, local oriented, and bring it to a whole variety of contexts. I don't think necessarily that the governance is actually or proven that local governance is really possible. Um, so before I get to that, I'm going to just talk about a couple of examples that I think use some of um, the ideas that, uh, that Hillary and, and Matt are basically applying some of the ideas. Before I get, get into that, one of the challenges that we face in working with USAID uh, projects on climate adaptation is that uh, there are a number of science advisors within USAID that want to take a razor blade and cut out the climate change signal and only invest in projects that have that very fine attribution. If it's climate change, we will invest in it. But it has anything to do with anything else anyone cares about in the community, but we can't fund that. So ironically, uh, Ghana, which is the country I'm going to talk example about, is not a climate change adaptation country. There's no pot of money allocated. Uh, in Tanzania, you can do all the climate change adaptation that you want. Ghana has a need, but it's really a bit difficult in the context of our fisheries projects to do anything, but we've been able to do, do things. The project I'm going to talk about is the precursor to our current fisheries project was called the Integrated Coastal Fisheries Governance Project, the NYC Wilson course, and it has a lot of the ideas that, that Matt uh, was talking about are sort of built into it. I'm going to give you some examples of our, our work on that. But a lot of what we do think about is the fact that climate change is really an amplifier of a whole bunch of other stressors and issues that are already going on in a place. And if you're actually going to be effective in doing any kind of governance, you have in addressing the, the individual needs that Hillary was talking about, you kind of look at the community as a whole, and it's, a bit, it's often a big challenge, but you kind of, kind of can't really talk, sort of back off from that. Um, issues like habitat loss may not be entirely climate-driven, uh, but we need to take, take a look at it. And we're interested in coastal resilience, which is a, a bigger idea about coastal communities than just taking care of one tiny little thing. So when we wrote our, our guidebook um, to climate adaptation, we tried to incorporate that sort of broader set of ideas. So I want to give you some examples, and I'm going to do my best, but Hillary, then you can kind of speak up and say, well, no, that's not quite right, um, how we did it. And it won't be quite right, because we didn't have the advantage in Ghana of, of your information and your, your indexes and so on. So as part of a much larger, a large earlier project on uh, fisheries, we worked in the western region of Ghana. And Ghana 
has a lot of oil, offshore oil and gas development occurring, but really no, no planning scheme uh, whatsoever. And this is the area of the 21st century. So as we've worked in coastal communities, we look encountered a number of uh, different kinds of, of problems. And we sort of take, a, I guess, an arts and craftsy, rather practical approach. And I think it encompasses some of the ideas that, that I was talking about. That in any place you want to recognize climate threats, but not completely you know, ignore all the others. Look at local assets exposed to climate and non-climate stresses. Look at the sensitivity of these assets to climate impacts. Evaluate the community's ability to adapt, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now, is how we try to do that. Um, draw some conclusions about vulnerability, and then in working with communities who want to be able to test some things out, we call no group regrets. You can try them, it would be beneficial even if the big climate, you know, the, the three meters of sea level rise doesn't happen and so on. But it was also important, again, tying it from the household level to the governance level, is that trying to make climate adaptation measures become a part of local and regional development plans. And we had a little bit of uh, success doing that. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have the benefit of Hillary's uh, uh, piece. And when we were doing this, our own adapt adaptive uh, capacity analysis, we were looking at 77 communities, basically fishing communities along the western region coast. And we looked at the literature at the time, this was about three years ago, and basically the conclusion was there really is no methodology for doing uh, comparative indices, uh, uh, what's the relative adaptive capacity of villages or districts. Uh, there's been some, there were some work done at the country level, there's some individual guidebooks from the South Pacific and so on. And so we basically, basically the, the writing at the time said, well, just make something up, and as long as you're, you apply it consistently, it's going to be helpful. So this doesn't benefit from Hillary's more so methodologically rigorous at that point of view, but we looked at, we did focus group interviews, we didn't do individual household interviews for these 77 communities, and essentially in scoring the places overall, just as a factor, but the security, law, and order, how comfortable did people feel with their own police and they feel secure from that? What was the degree of leadership in local organization? Public awareness of local conditions, such as erosion, shifting the river course, other things that might be climate or hazards uh, what's going on with land use decision making, and each of these factors, as I read them off, is lower and less and less present in, in most of the coastal communities that we looked at. What is the condition of coastal resources? Are the needs of marginalized groups being attended to? Uh, what's going on with livelihoods? And that really resonated with what she said about the youth aspect of it. All these coastal communities, although their parents may have livelihoods and fisheries, the kids are basically seeing no future for themselves. That's a huge uh, source of insecurity. And emergency preparedness, um, uh, basically a very, very poor and un unknown factor. So I want to give you an exa example from a Hunter West district. So we tried to map this. We basically mapped it in two ways. One is we simply counted the number of different kinds of hazards each of those was facing. And then secondly, it came up with some kind of a scale of uh, uh, essentially, uh, here's the count from the worst place awkward, I would really give you an example of seven different, because I, we couldn't conceive of any real robust way to figure out well, how exposed is this place to so many different kinds of climate and climate stresses. Um, and then the second part on the right hand side is basically, well, when you run our little uh, set of interviews, our index is again to benefit from sort of Hillary's systematic stuff. Very, very few places even made it up to 50%, I mean F, F level. And some of the places were basically complete disaster areas. So as a project, we're trying to figure out, do you work in the disaster areas because that's where the problems are the most intense, or you do your run away from them and work in the places where you, because it's a foreign assistance project, right? And everyone wants to be an attribution of doing great things. You work in the easiest place and basically do something really quick that really works well, and then you, freak, you ignore all the places in the orange and the red zone. Well, in the, being CRC, we had to go to the worst place, and uh, so we looked at Aquadai, which is a fishing village basically in the throes of disappearing. And so part of what we're looking at is good information. What do people remember about, you know, again, using local knowledge? Um, shoreline, rapid shoreline change, and why are people still there? We had a couple thousand people living in what's called Old Town. Well, Ghana already had a new town ready for them, ready and open for business. Why aren't they moving? And they pointed out some important things is that you may want to move, but you can't move. You don't have the bags of cement, you don't have a, a plot, or some other reasons. And so those are all factors that really loom large in our sort of arts and craftsy view of all this. But even though the place is a mess, and this in particular because it's faced problems coming in from the sea. Also, it happens to be at the mouth of the river that's draining a good port, large portion of the Akwadai district, including its main urban area. So essentially, it's like the worst possible place, yet people didn't want to move. I mean, fishermongers didn't want to move. The fishermen were tired. It goes up and stay there. 
And so what can, you, can we be possibly doing? So we try to come up with a set of very practical actions saying, you know, we really ought to think about moving to Newtown, and that's got to be one of the things. You should be doing some real monitoring to keep track of where, what's happening to your village and how soon is the whole thing going to disappear. Um, look at emergency response. So during those heavy periods of rain, which might get worse from climate change or not, I'm not sure, sea level rise, which is really a slow changing thing, but still, this is like super exposed, and the community is super weak. Um, but there were a number of different ideas working in this one place that could could think of. Um, so that's an example of even in the most desperate situation, some of these ideas, there is hope. There's, in other words, there's a governance side of it that you can start somewhere and uh, start moving up, up, up the ladder in terms of local awareness, willing to set some kind of targets, and basically trying to get higher levels of government. Okay, another example is, a, is a, an adjacent district called Shama, um, where it's sort of a different kind of set of issues. One is tourism development being placed right in the wetlands and beach faces. A lot of the economies uh, of the poor fishermen and uh, fish mong fishmongers, women, the smoking uh, fish smoking operation, which are basically their livelihood is right in the beach face, very subject to erosion and, and very uh, very improvised types of shoreline protection, really no planning, no, no, it's non-engineered shore protection, which really isn't going to help them very much. And a tremendous amount of impoverished settlements, and of course the poorest people are living in the most vulnerable areas. Now from a scientific point of view, basically say like, get out of Shama. Uh, Shama is the sort of totally red zone. This is a study of shoreline change over, uh, over a century, basically. The rates of shoreline erosion like measured in meters per year. But why are people staying there for the same reason? It's not always easy to move. So one of the things we did was we had local university look at, well, is there some way to let people know when floods are happening and so on, to avoid the loss of life? For the first time ever, get the district to think about, you know, maybe we should move people out before the rains come, and maybe we should look at where the places are most home. Maybe we should come up with some policies that actually prevent people from building in the floodplain. Now, you know, country that's like Ghana, that's disorganized with governance system, it's very top down, it looks pretty, doesn't work very well, trying to take it back. And that was describing and starting from the bottom up. At least we had one district, Shama, brought some people, brought folks here to, to University of Rhode Island, they had a chance to kind of look at how things are being done here, said, well, we can't copy Rhode Island, but we could adopt an ordinance, a floodplain ordinance. We could fight about putting new developments in those particular moments. And so they took the tool that they had. There's no natural coastal policy, but they made up something that starts them down that pathway. Um, and then once they got from flooding, they said, well, what about your shoreline as a whole? Aren't there places that are so exposed and so dangerous and so vulnerable to the shore uh, you know, well, hazards and um, future climate change that you might want to discourage development from those places? Well, sure, they can take some coloring markers and do their shoreline and say, you know, we prefer development to go here versus there, and they, they've tried to do that. Again, this is without any national support. This is pretty much unknown, but it's a place to start taking, you know, government, going from the local and individual needs to, to, to the government. Okay, to, to sum up with some of our experiences here, um, basically, even now, in the 21st century, any local places that we work with are still part, really have to be considered pioneers. Well, heck, you look in the United States, where I don't just recently adopted very early climate change uh, policies into this closest own building uh, regulations and so on. And the United States isn't exactly on the cutting edge here. But um, one of the things is that make the commitment and take enough time to prepare an adaptation plan that most everyone supports, take the kind of insights that I was talking about in particular. And if the process works, and I can assure you that it actually might work if you do the kind of listening that I was describing, you've got to be ready to do something right now. Um, again, on the governance side, the communities are going to want to follow up process works out is that we want to do things right now, uh, simple things that we can do, tangible actions. And so projects have to be ready not just to do the study, but to go the step. Um, but we also recognize the governance dimension, which is in, in local communities, adaptation actions face a lot of barriers. You can't really do a regulation or a policy without support, not from the village, but from the next layer of authority. It's up and you have to have them engaged. Also, ultimately, you need money to invent, to, to deal with all those uh, adaptation policies in place. Someone has to be there to do the regulation, to do the education, and so on. So one of the outcomes, I guess, is back to see what was design of the earlier project, was that we did manage through an example like Shama, where we bring enough people in after a while, and say, well, 
we have a district that's actually trying to do some adaptation? Wow, that's amazing. I've never seen that before in Ghana. So the National Development Planning Commission adopted policies that they shall in all coastal districts. We want to see next development plans, hazards, and climate change adaptation included. And at least that raises the question um, that now the districts have to, have to start paying attention to the, this kind of cutting edge. And then, even without a giant project, we think that once a couple of districts start showing some kind of initiative and showing some kind of, yes, we can kind of attitude, the others are going to quickly follow and say, we want it like them. We want what they're doing. We want to do it. So basically, I just, you know, I think our work would have been a little bit better if we had the study before. We we're trying to do stuff up on our own. So I think it's very helpful that, sure, we're doing a lot of arts and crafts of stuff that's very helpful. But, uh, there's other ways in which sort of more systematic approaches to trying to capture what's going on in communities, and trying to be more systematic in thinking about governance that you can start even with simple humble and pretty awful situations um, and make some problem problems there. Okay, and I brought a couple of copies of things in the back of this is this. Um, anyway, so I, I hope that gives this for a little bit of that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks very much, Don. Um, so there we have it. We've had three very different presentations. Um, the first two kind of gave us a real flavor of um, case studies within the Dominican Republic and across different regions of the Dominican Republic. And uh, thanks to Don, we've also had a, a real insight into other, another region of the world in Africa, in Ghana, um, and the resiliency of communities there. So I think this uh, is a good safe way to open up uh, to our Q&A. But before we do that, um, I'm just going to grab a copy of the publication to show to you guys. Um, I'm sure you've seen it but I, I'm pretty sure I should show it to you. Um, so this is the publication that we have. Uh, it's at the back of the room. It's in English and in Spanish. Uh, feel free to grab a copy and either language as you leave. Uh, and it has a, a lot more information, obviously, contained within the publication with references and other websites that uh, they refer to in their presentations as well. Um, so I'm, I'm going to open up the floor. I have my own personal question, I thought I'd, I'd throw to the three of you first, because we've heard um, about all your research and the field work that you've done. So I thought, as, a, as an opening question, I just wondered, uh, in each of the areas that you visited during your field work, what struck you the most about the communities and their level of resiliency? So it's just to get maybe a bit more of the flavor of the people that you, that you spoke to, uh, and. Uh, and yeah, what, what you thought of the communities themselves and how resilient were they um, to bearing in mind what needs they, they, they have uh, for capacity, adaptive capacity. First, I'll start with you. Um, I think one of the things that came out, um, so I talked before about sole income providers and people who had other shared people in the home, but most people, one of the other tests that I ran that had no significant difference <coughs> was the amount of occupations that one person would hold. And I think in terms of <coughs> flexibility and adaptive capacity, there are a lot of people who may identify as a fisherman, but if you actually keep asking them, they also, they're a multiconcho, or you know, they, they sell lotto tickets at their brother's bodega and all this little stuff like that. So I think, and I think that's why it didn't show up as different, because no matter no matter what, whether you're a fisherman or you just run a shop or you're a, hair, you're a barber or whatever, I think a strong sign of resilience is occupational diversity, and there was a lot of that, even if it wasn't all formal and even if it wasn't all, you know, making the big bucks. There was, there was a widespread of people who were willing to do things to make income, and I think that's important for their willingness to be diverse. By offhand, I would say the difference is um, the difference in urban versus rural. I guess especially when we're thinking like marine resource users, we're thinking of the fishing communities um, where there's a real desire to stay with that profession. But the sort of the the risks, and when we're thinking about like a, you know, those risks that you're open to, I think the when I saw in Santo Domingo these urban centers where folks were really um, getting hit by a lot of flooding whenever there's storms or um, even with just high tides and wanting to 
again, the same narrative we've been repeating is there's land up on the high land that's drier or safer, but there's either the not the ability, either the resources or just the, will, the not the wanting to leave. But just the, that poverty and risk in the urban area is just so much more raw and brutal. Um, you know, that was my major takeaway, those two distinctions that I've made. I think that the, the, the group that needs the least education are the folks who live in uh, coastal communities. The problem lies at the layers above that. It was, we did uh, similar work in Zanzibar, and we had uh, very, very talented local university people lead the work, and I have a, a, a video, one of our online videos, a quote from her. She was shocked at how close local knowledge matched what the scientists had come up with. Like, wow. Um, and part of the reason I made the comment that you really have to be ready to do stuff is that it doesn't, a lot of environmental change is not rocket science to people who actually try to make a living and to grow food or to, they see a physical change happening and, and where they live over time. What they're not getting is appropriately scaled help and recognition from the layers of government up above them that whether it be from emergency preparedness to enough support so they could re relocate from town to new town and there's several examples um, in, in, in where we work in Ghana where people are ready to change or they're ready to recognize but they need the material help to to shift or they need a project to come in that isn't going to just dump rocks in some futile way to quote unquote help the uh, fishermen uh, where their landing sites being uh, lost but actually something more thoughtful than that, that so it's not a problem of people being unaware I think most fishers they know how the place works. It's, this, it's the, the middle level people, it's our, the outsiders who come in who are the ones that are really get in the way, I think, in, in many cases. Um, so to me, that's been one of our, my experiences is that I'm constantly amazed at how amazed people who are educated and who do studies and so on um, are, you know, are surprised at how much their local folks actually know. They, they know a huge amount. And it's not, you just have to open ask people and they talk about it and they can be quite accurate in, in their understanding of how, where the shoreline was before, what do they see is changing, how are their crops changing and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's everybody else up at the next levels of government that gets in the way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to give a big round of applause to our, our speakers here today. Thank you very much for your, for your presentations. Um, Thank you all for coming. Uh, I, we have another the 15 minutes for the room, and we have refreshments and uh, some fruit and vegetables, very healthy spread uh, for you guys to, 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 to enjoy. And, and please you know, feel free to, to talk to our speakers as well if you have more questions, if you think of anything else. Um, in terms of the foundation, uh, we're, the Fellows Program is a, is a continuing program, so we, we are uh, continually accepting um, further fellows with other universities in addition to URI. Um, so we, we, we look to have more presentations like these. Um, so if you have signed our registration sheet, we'll include, include you on our newsletter so you can get more information about future events that we're doing. Um, and we also do events in New York where we have an office, uh, the UN, in DC, uh, and also if, if you do go to the Dominican Republic, we have uh, events there as well. Um, so thank you again once again for joining us today, and uh, I hope you have a nice afternoon. Thank you.